Welcome to Ecotopia, an environmental affairs program. Your source of bacteria-rich, future-focused environmental information and Australia's self-appointed home of direct action reporting. In this week's episode, James is impressed by some aquaponics. Leith is stumped by a bureaucratic stuff-up in the Telangi State Forest. I'll be explaining the Pakala and Sokolo model for global emissions reduction. And right now, Adam puts together Ecotopia's Guide to Sustainable Travel. Now why would you want to pack up and leave Melbourne in the middle of winter? Are you crazy? But if you must, it's a big wide world out there with a lot of places to go and people to see. But how do you see it all without costing the earth, literally? Well here at Ecotopia we thought we'd put together our green guide to sustainable travel. Now, when it comes to travel, your flights are public enemy number one. According to the Australian Academy of Science, just one return trip between Sydney and London produces around 5.7 tonnes of carbon dioxide per person. That's about what the average Australian produces from their combined car and electricity emissions for a whole year. Now the commercial use of biofuel on flights is still some time away and there's a lot of debate about whether it's even beneficial to the environment. So presently, the only way to counter your emissions is to offset them. So we've decided to find out just how many people chose to fly carbon neutral today. Now where did you fly in from? Uh, Launceston. Did you decide to offset the carbon emissions from your flight today? No, I didn't. Not really. I don't have enough information about it, probably. Well, I must admit, I didn't actually have much say in it. It was all paid through work. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, how are you going? Good, thanks. Where so, are you flying to today? Uh, Karatha. Karatha. Awesome. Now, did you choose to fly carbon neutral with this flight? Um, no. No? <laughs> no? Did you know that you could? No. So, no. Why didn't you do that? Uh, didn't give me the option. I don't know. <laughs> no. No, why not? I just didn't think about it. I have done it in the past. Okay, great. Yeah, this particular time, I think I was... Yeah, I had to do it nice and quick, so yeah. I had to check. So thanks to that highly in-depth piece of research, it's pretty clear that more people could take up the option to offset their emissions. Now, when it comes to choosing green accommodation, you can rest easy because more and more eco-friendly options are popping up. Now, Melbourne's Alto Hotel is leading the way as Australia's first carbon neutral hotel. And we are here to find out more. Is it a challenge being a four-star hotel in the middle of Melbourne? Being eco and sustainable doesn't mean that you have to go without or compromise. Uh, and I think we've done that pretty well here in being a four-star standard hotel, but yet uh, everything is done in the most uh, minimal footprint uh, possible. Uh, so it is possible to have your cake and eat it too. So Gary, I've got to tell you, I often like to steal the pens from a hotel room. What can you tell me about this pen? Well, one, love you to steal it, but also when it stops writing, throw it in the bin, it's made out of cornstarch and will break down to organic material. Fantastic. If you're staying in a conventional hotel and want to do the right thing, don't steal all the shampoo on the first day. What? <laughs> Leave it till the last day at least so they don't get replaced all the time. Well this is an easy tip that everyone really should know already. If you're travelling around, hang your towels up, don't get them replaced. And even if they do, go down to reception and say, please don't replace my towels if I hang them up. LEDs are great because they use very little energy and they still give a good amount of light to read by or to see your lovely face. Fantastic. You actually have two beehives on the roof. Tell me a little bit about that. We do have two beehives on our roof which uh, are a great talking point and uh, probably the best thing about that is that apart from um, improving the biodiversity of the, the local area, so there's more flowers, uh, more trees, uh, helping the environment that way. Um, but I think the best thing for us is we get lovely sweet honey at the end of the process. So I've had to don the protective gear for this assignment, but here we are on the rooftop at the Alto and here are the bees being busy, as bees do. And what they're doing is actually producing this. Now exploring your destination on foot is still the greenest and the cheapest way to get around and many city information services offer free walking tour guides or you can join an organised tour and get set to see what makes your choice of city tick. <laughs> <laughs> but at 
at the time it was quite a tourist attraction. So Sarah, tell me why exploring on foot is such a great way to get to know a city. When you're on foot, it's a bit slower, you're breathing in the smells, you're seeing the people, you're hearing the noises, and you're looking down little places that you probably wouldn't look normally. And you stop and you look up at buildings. I think, you know, when you're running around in a car or on a tram or on a bus, you're just kind of seeing the lower eye line. Tell us a little bit about that building behind you there. So that beautiful yellow building behind us is the Manchester Unity Building and that was built in 1936. And because it was the Great Depression at the time, there was a large workforce available. So that building actually went up really quickly. Each floor was one week at a time. That's amazing. You know what? It looks like something straight out of Batman. Absolutely, yeah. It does have that gothic feel to it. Ecotopia's top five travel tips. Number one, start your holiday at home. Switch off your home or office to minimize energy use while you're away. Number two, go paperless with eDocs on your smartphone. Don't forget this only works if your phone is charged, so don't forget your charger. Number three, pack light. Take carry-on luggage only if you can get away with it. You'll minimise your carbon footprint and you'll get a few extra minutes holiday while you're not waiting at the baggage carousel. Number four, pack a reusable water bottle. It's simple but incredibly effective. If you can drink the water, fill it up straight from the tap, otherwise boil it up overnight to kill off any of those nasties. Tip number five, share the love. Swap or recycle your old guidebooks. There you go, Gary. Thanks, Adam. Happy holidays. living through an energy revolution. The world is changing before our very eyes and bit by bit our lives are being powered by the power of the sun, the wind and the earth. It's a great time to be alive. A staggering 80% of the world's energy needs are still met by coal. Renewables are slowly coming online, but it simply takes time to build our solar, tidal and wind farms. But time is something we do not have. The world's climate is already changing and globally we need to step up the pace and move into our low carbon future. It's so easy to get depressed about global warming, but seriously, don't. As a planet, we already have the industrial know-how to get us through this climate problem. A model by two guys called Stephen Pakala and Rob Sokolow from Princeton University has been around for 10 years and shows us the answer. It's called the Stabilisation Wedge Scenario. So this is our concentration of our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. At the moment we're about at 392 parts per million and predictions are if we keep ticking along as we are we're going to hit over 650 parts per million. Some people think it's a little bit less, loads of people think it's a lot more at about 2050. Now the world at 650 parts per million is a pretty dire place to live. We're talking massive sea level rises, flooding of coastal areas, people moving countries. So this triangle represents the amount of carbon dioxide that we have to prevent from going into our atmosphere within the next 40 years. It's a bucket load. So the solution proposed by Pakala and Sokolo is to split this big problem triangle into wee wedges. So each of these wedges represent a different technology to reduce CO2 in our atmosphere. Now these technologies aren't science fiction like the flux capacitor out of Back to the Future. Each of these technologies have been demonstrated and proven to work on big scales. If we need to reduce carbon dioxide even further, we just add another wedge. So one of these wedges is energy efficiency. The homes, that's things like double glazing and turning off your lights. Other wedges are carbon capture and storage, reducing reliance on cars, uh, biofuels, PV, solar power, wind. All of these options are going to add up to reducing our carbon dioxide over time. We have the answer to our climate problem. We just need to stop debating it and move forward. The problem isn't too big. We need to embrace all the technologies available and move into our low carbon future. Goodbye windmills! People of Ecotopia, 
Your attention for the next few seconds. Remember, Ecotopians, caring is sharing. I'll care, you share with me. Hi there. One of the things that I've learned while making Ecotopia is that it's all connected. Everywhere we've been, scientists, engineers, farmers and fruit sellers have told us the same thing. If we have a healthy environment, healthy food and sustainable habits, we'll be healthier, happier people. Today I've come to central Victoria to find more evidence for this theory. I'm here in the King Parrot catchment where a group of local people are using wildlife study and appreciation to heal their entire community. We've got a beautiful um, mix, a lovely waterway, a river, a creek, a lovely creek. We've got beautiful mountains in the centre of the Great Dividing Range here, the Valley of a Thousand Hills. We've got the open farmland around Strath Creek uh, and some fairly large properties. And then moving up to Flauto, we've got smaller settlements, much more densely settled, much more densely forested too. So we have a beautiful mixture of, um, in, uh, of environmental attractions. Assets. Assets, yeah. Mm. And um, that, that is what draws us anyway to, to Flower Island Strath Creek. The townships of Flowerdale and Strath Creek were heavily hit during the Black Saturday bushfires of 2009. The awesome power of the blaze left the forests and the communities badly scarred. Following the fires, which of course devastated the, the local uh, forests, the Mount Disappointment Forest was just absolutely burned out. If you go deeply into the Flowerdale township area and they suffered terribly, there are still a lot of people who are very reluctant to replant and revegetate. You can understand that people are frightened of having vegetation around them. I mean, justifiably, it's, it was, the fires were pretty scary, for, well, extremely scary for a lot of people. And they don't want to have things near their house. And, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of push to cut down vegetation along the side of the road by people, by residents and by the council. And I mean, you can really understand why. But, uh, because it's frightening. I mean, it's really frightening. But it's a good thing, I think, for people to know what animals live in them, so they might think a second time. Just one innovative idea from the local land care group enabled the community to discover new life and new hope living in the remnant patches of bush on their own properties. In January 2011, the Upper Goulburn Land Care Network began monitoring wildlife using remote cameras and audio recorders on patches of private land in the Flowerdale Strath Creek area. The Focus on Fauna team hoped to gain a deeper understanding of the status of local wildlife in the aftermath of the Black Saturday bushfires. The project was part of a community response to learn from that event, share stories, rebuild and celebrate a part of Victoria that was so badly damaged in February 2009. It's almost a a lead in toward healthy communities. It's all very well to have a healthy environment, but it's important that you have a healthy community. I think there is a connection between uh, the recovery of the wildlife and the sort of recovery of the community. Seeing wildlife and knowing that it's out there on their private properties, uh, I think sort of lifts the spirit a bit, you know. While the bush is recovering, and there must be a gradual return of animals to the bush, birds and animals to the bush, it's clear that um, We've, we are seeing lots of animals and birds that we probably have never noticed before. That's why I suppose we were trying to focus on those small remnant patches on people's property and how valuable they were as, as refuges for that um, uh, fleeing wildlife. So I suppose the hope was with this project is just to sort of say that the bush isn't a threat, it's, it's part of the whole nature of things. There are always going to be fires. And it's trying to get people back to, to realising that the bush is a benefit, um, not just for them, but for, for the wildlife.
it's not just that these native creatures are cute and cuddly and fun to watch frolic about. Getting together, viewing these survivors, really galvanised the community's appreciation of the natural world and their continued place within it. Having the, the whole project on the internet was uh, terrific for people that had moved out for a period of time and were looking at coming back to the district. You could see your neighbours' um, properties and what that uh, captured on their properties. It was like um, down in the suburbs with uh, people with the Joneses, you know, oh, so and so got a wombat and a baby. Well, you know, we're going to try and get a Fasca or we'll try and get, you know, a qual if we could. <laughs> the abundance of animals living and thriving on private property was encouraging, not just for wildlife enthusiasts in the area. It also inspired other people to learn more about the creatures they share their homes with. And it provided a good reason to catch up and compare notes. I think on the night on possum. Well, I enjoyed the night on frogs. Yeah. So, With the help of local landholders, we have created a valuable knowledge base and an inspiring collection of stories about our wildlife. The project has strengthened our community and our commitment to land care. It's given us a vehicle to inspire the community. If we could continue a program like the focus on fauna, as Noreen said, I think it will bring the community more into land care and get people into a community-minded thing of something for the wildlife. Instead of just sort of thinking, oh, well, that's my block, I'm not going to do something because it might benefit you next door. Whereas if we can all work together, we're going to improve it for everything. Okay, love, so if you cook a delicious dinner, I'll do the dishes. But your dinners are always delicious. <laughs> Okay, cheerio. Bye. At Ecotopia, we love the idea of cooperative relationships, like clownfish and sea anemones, oxpeckers and rhinos, metcops and fair evaders. Here, again at Ceres Park, probably Melbourne's centre for sustainability, we've found a relationship that's so clever it's got its own name, aquaponics. Aquaponics is a relatively new science. The word is a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. It's a sustainable food production system using plants and fish. I believe it should be called plish, but I'm no expert. Stephen is. So in essence you've got fish which produce waste, you've got bacteria which converts that waste to a form that plants can use, and you've got plants which are growing in water. Stephen, what plants do you grow here? In the system here we have mostly leafy greens, so herbs, um, we supply series fair food with coriander, basil, parsley, mint, lettuces, uh, spinach, lightweight herbs, mostly leafy greens. How does aquaponics address the problems with aquaculture? So in the hydroponics industry, and that industry produces uh, much of the vegetable produce that we see in supermarkets, you have to introduce a mined nutrient source in aquaculture. You have a nutrient waste stream. You combine the two together and you get aquaponics, which is when the waste stream from aquaculture is used for the input for hydroponics. So we have fish at that end. We've got this grow bed here, which is one long trough of water with um, rafts floating on top. And the water is flowing through the grow bed. The plants are uptaking the nutrients, um, floating on rafts, and then the water is pumped through this pipe back to the fish. So here we have some um, fairly healthy looking coriander. Um, so the coriander are growing on top of this raft. Wow! Um, you can see that the roots dangle down into the water and are looking pretty healthy. So the plants are simply Straight floating in. on water. If they don't grow in soil, what do they grow in? So they germinate in the coconut fibre and then we take a plug which has the seedling and drop that into this net pot. The roots will grow through the net pot and down into the water. So they just sit in suspension in the water. So um, for harvest, yep. we simply pull the lettuce out, pull the roots off, slide the net pot off, which we reuse, put a rubber band around it, and that's your finished product. Beauty. Let us eat. <laughs>
It's a balanced ecosystem that needs know-how and attention. But with zero emissions, I think it's pretty cool. And the results? Delicious. Hey Ecotopians, I'm on the edge of Tulangi State Forest, just 50 k from Melbourne and next door to the famous Yarra Valley. It's also home to Victoria's formal emblem, the endangered Leadbeater's Possum. Tulangi Forest is predominantly mountain ash and it's classified as a wet forest and today it's certainly staying true to its name. metres in circumference, this massive tree is an example of where leadbeater possums live. In fact, one was seen on the outside of this very tree. Sadly, with the destruction of a lot of this forest during the 2009 bushfires, this possum now faces serious risk of extinction. Experts estimate between 1 and 2,000 remain in the wild. The reasons for this are complex. I'm in Gun Barrel Coop and I'm joined by Trent Patton. Trent, thanks for joining us today. No worries. So why Vic Forest logging so much of Tulangi? After the 2009 fires, a lot of this uh, resource up here, the, uh, the forest was taken out and it's restricted the amount of available timber to be harvested. Uh, so in our opinion, they're concentrating uh, the logging harvesting uh, in the unburnt areas of, of this type of forest. People at home might see possums as a nuisance. Why are the lead beaters important? I suppose the brush-tailed possum can be a bit um, challenging at times in suburbia. Um, we're not talking about a brush-tailed possum up here. In fact, they're quite rare up in these parts of the, um, the forest. You're talking um, a lead beater possum, which is quite an endangered possum. It's about the size of a yeah, about the size of a tennis ball. It's about 140 grams thereabouts. It's a bit it's not your average possum. There's a known to be known to be um, about a thousand to two thousand less according to ANU. It's very rare. Um, I, I have been looking for possums out here extensively and uh, they're not easy to come by. The habitat for this lead beater uh, possum is, has been dramatically reduced to a very small part and Talangi is part of that uh, area. If big forests have their way, parts of Talangi forest will go from this to this. Oh. I'm outside the forest blockade camp which has been here for six weeks. I'm going to talk to some people to find out where they're from and what it's been like living here. Uh, my name's Steve and I live in Talangi, just five minutes up the road from where we're standing now. After the 2009 fires, um, there was a lot of salvage logging in the areas of the forest that were burned. About two thirds of Talangi State Forest got burned and there's a patch that we call the hole in the donut. It's about a third of Talangi State Forest that escaped the fires. And that's an important area now as a refuge for wildlife and also an area that wildlife can exist in and breed in and as the forest around it starts to recover then wildlife can move back out into the forest. Since the fires the intensity of the logging has really increased. Vic forests needed to go harder on the areas that were left to meet the contracts that they had rather than declaring what they call force majeure which is where they say there's been this massive event and we can't supply the resource Instead, they go into other unaffected areas of the forest and, and log to meet their contracts. Well, my name's Kat and uh, I'm from Coburg, born and bred. I've been arrested uh, twice now, so I can't really get arrested again. So I'm pretty much just like trying to be a nanny at the camp, um, which is sort of getting to me a little bit because all I want to do is run in there and stop them. And um, it's so pointless because all the trees are being used for is furniture 
and like to the standard of furniture that's being made now uh, that it gets it gets used for like a few years it breaks and then it ends up in the tip even if the rest of it gets used for paper then that gets thrown in the tip it just gets used once and gets thrown in the tip the whole thing's been used for rubbish I'm Ray Lewis um, I'm a local resident and I run an alpaca farm it's a lead beater possum is a rare species. I'm concerned about what's happening to our forest. Our local member said, well, if you cut the forest down, they'll move somewhere else, but they, they won't move because mm. they're territorial. And the, uh, the mammals are just, you know, like they're territorial and they need to stay in the same area that they're in. Well, today I've seen two very different sides of Tulangi Forest. Between bushfires and current logging practices, there is serious doubt about the lead beater possum survival. Let's hope that it can outsmart us humans. And that is all for this week. Don't forget that all our segments are available online at ecotopiatv.com. And if you want to have your say, jump onto our Facebook page. Next week's episode is going to be the last of the series and we're going to go out with a bang. We'll be talking about some sustainable fashion and getting some hair care tips from rocker Andrew WK. See you next week, Egotopians. Oh. <laughs>